Michael Kenny is an attorney, educator, author, producer, but mostly he is a father of seven children and a husband. He is a double domer, having earned an undergraduate and law degree from the University of Notre Dame. After practicing law for 13 years, he transitioned into higher education. He has taught and served in several capacities in Catholic education for more than 20 years. His love for America's founding principles inspired him to serve as the co-executive producer for the new hit movie, Unplanned. Additionally, he co-authored the well-received new book, In God We Trust, Morally Responsible Investing. The National Catholic Register recently ran an editorial called, Is Unplanned the Uncle Tom's Cabin of Our Era? Before Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, many people were able to ignore slavery by thinking out of sight, out of mind. But then Uncle Tom's Cabin hit the scene in 1852 and became a runaway bestseller. After reading about the horrors of slavery in a story format, the American people could no longer turn a blind eye to man's inhumanity to man. Uncle Tom's Cabin was so impactful, in fact, that when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe for the first time, he said, so you're the little lady who wrote the book that started this great war. Similarly, as we can see, the impact of unplanned is palpable. With over 100 abortion industry workers leaving the abortion industry in a matter of weeks, untold numbers of hearts and minds have been changed. Ooh. Untold number of hearts and minds have been changed, with many women stating that they decided to keep their babies after seeing this movie. Just two days ago, at the National Catholic Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C., the Bishop of Phoenix, Reverend Thomas Olmsted, said these words, Christ calls us to stand up for each child. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we can do this. We were made for times such as this. God destined us for these historical circumstances. May we be ready each day to say with Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. Michael, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you to the cast and crew of Unplanned for having the courage to stand up for those who have no voice. And most of all, thank you for answering God's call with here I am, Lord, send me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Catherine Banked, uh, Jennifer and Peggy and I want to add my thanks to that for organizing this venue. I also want to make a special word of gratitude uh, to my sister Colleen who sent an email inviting people to go see Unplanned and Catherine had already seen it but was so inspired that Colleen would send out a message to all the friends that Catherine asked a little bit and found out I was coming. And those of you who know Scott and Catherine, they are people who respond to opportunities. And so Catherine and Scott, primarily Catherine, I'd have to say, <laughs> uh, has done a sort of nonstop arranging uh, all sorts of interesting uh, opportunities. And uh, this is a very special opportunity for me because um, we're seated in a venue that uh, celebrates the arts, uh, donated um, through the generosity of a, a really remarkable filmmaker uh, who filmed so many great films in this area. Uh, this evening, what I'd like to do is just spend two or three minutes introducing uh, a 30-minute film that you will all watch. Uh, the 30-minute film uh, was created in an effort to sort of promote the film to certain audiences before, and I like to call it the making of Unplanned. It gives you a behind-the-scenes perspective about the many remarkable dimensions to this story. I would have to say that it's not an exaggeration to indicate the many miraculous dimensions to this story. Uh, so then, after the showing of the 30-minute film, uh, we uh, open it up to questions. and. 
there have been some venues where that Q&A period has been the best part of the whole experience, um, and some have lasted for more than an hour. It'll be up to those who are running this event to decide how long you want to do that. I'm also going to be available at the table afterwards. Uh, Catherine and Scott have instructed me to go there to sign books if you want them signed, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, the book is a, a, a beautiful story in itself. So many people who have seen this 30-minute um, film have said, gosh, I just feel compelled to do something. And the book, in brief, is the story of a man 20 years ago at the same time that this story is beginning. 40 Days for Life begins with this event. Abby Johnson begins with this event. And George Swartz was approached by Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's Pizza, and said, is it possible to create a mutual fund where I can have the peace of mind that none of my money is supporting pornography or abortion or corporations that choose to support abortion, Planned Parenthood in particular? And George said, you know, I don't know. The, you know, the economy is so commingled. You think of just the um, hotels, you know, a lot of hotels. I don't know if they still do, but at one time they had these so-called adult channels, you know, the, you know, uh, prime hotels like Marriott and so forth. So that means you can't invest in Marriott. So his wife, Judy, said, George, you really need to look at this and work at this. And uh, he did. They developed these screens and they identify first companies that are, have a very fine business model and then they place them through these screens. And each of those companies receive a letter that says, um, you have been selected because you have a, a strong business model, but also because you do not support pornography or abortion or uh, Planned Parenthood. And if you do change course on any of those categories, then we will withdraw our funding. Uh, it turns out a couple companies have. Uh, George Swartz and his firm withdrew, and then those companies changed back, and then they got back in the portfolio. Now, from the beginning, George Swartz, as a business person, said, you know, all of this is good, but these funds have to work. Uh, there are five funds. One of them is rated number one in its category, and all of them are competing against uh, all the best funds. So, so I just said, George, you've got a powerful pro-life story here, and I said, I'm not a finance person, but I, I'd like to tell your story. And so as we wrote this story, um, it begins to tell the story of America. If you think of America essentially is founded by investors who invested in the Mayflower that came over. And uh, it gave us a chance to talk about a lot of interesting things. There was one reviewer that said, every person who loves America should read this book. Uh, so it seems that Unplanned and this book are coming out at an appropriate time, and uh, the message of Unplanned ultimately is one of great hope. And I would end by suggesting to you that, uh, well, first of all, I would like to just see a show of hands how many have seen the film Unplanned. Okay, great. So a lot of you have. Um, that at, at the end of the film, we have a person in our country, which should make us all very proud, who is anonymous, who has said that for long as that as long as that film is in the theaters, the message that comes on the screen where those who want counseling can immediately contact that line, and I will provide the funding to ensure that there is a live counselor available as long as the film is running. It's astonishing. <laughs> so. Uh, we have received requests for this film from over 17 countries. Uh, there's lots to be told. I'm happy to answer any questions. And so at this point, though, I suggest it would be a good time to start uh, the film. And uh, Rick, if you're ready to do that, we can do that.
it's just my story. I worked at Planned Parenthood for eight years, um, loved my job, loved what I did, believed that I was helping women. That's how I got involved in Planned Parenthood. And then really had my eyes opened. I just moved away from the catheter. They always move. That's why I do it this way. And I knew then that abortion took the life of an individual and unique human being. And I knew if those two things were true, then I was on the wrong side of this issue. I was on the wrong side of this debate. We had a, a wonderful girl that we know uh, by the name of Megan Harrington. She came up to us. Uh, she's a Hollywood producer. She came up to us and gave us the book Unplanned by Abby Johnson. Said you should make this a movie. I mean, someone that went from one side of the fence to literally the other side of the fence on such a, a hot button issue as abortion. Um, to me, that's that's a powerful story. So as soon as we read the book, I was on board. About a year, year and a half ago, uh, we were coming together and praying about what are we going to do, what's up ahead, and we felt specifically at this time that it was it was time to make Unplanned. I would get emails all the time from people who would say, uh, I have no experience in film, but I read your book and I want to turn it into a movie. I actually believed Abby more when she came into my office and told me she was now pro-life than I believed Chuck and Carrie when they called and said, we're making a movie about Abby Johnson and we need to portray you and your wife. And I'm like, who is this? The email just said, we read your book, we'd like to turn it into a film, uh, we'd love to talk with you. And it was signed, Chuck Konzelman. And I didn't know who that was. After she told me her story and we talked about the lawsuit and what had happened and her history, I was just blown away. And I said, you know, this is, this is probably going to be a book one day. I said, they may even make a movie out of this. Abby's story is the most powerful story that the pro-life world has experienced up until this point. Sometimes the bravest thing you can possibly do is change your mind, and that's what Abby did. Seeing both sides and still having that characteristic of passion. story. I worked at Planned Parenthood for eight years, um, loved my job, loved what I did, believed that I was helping women. That's how I got involved in Planned Parenthood. And then really had my eyes opened. I just moved away from the catheter. They always move. That's why I do it this way. And I knew then that abortion took the life of an individual and unique human being. And I knew if those two things were true, then I was on the wrong side of this issue. I was on the wrong side of this debate. We had a, a wonderful girl that we know uh, by the name of Megan Harrington. She came up to us. Uh, she's a Hollywood producer. She came up to us and gave us the book Unplanned by Abby Johnson. Said you should make this a movie. I mean, someone that went from one side of the fence to literally the other side of the fence on such a, a hot button issue as abortion. Um, to me, that's that's a powerful story. So as soon as we read the book, I was on board. About a year, year and a half ago, uh, we were coming together and praying about what are we gonna do, what's up ahead, and we felt specifically at this time that it was, it was time to make Unplanned. I would get emails all the time 
from people who would say, uh, I have no experience in film, but I read your book and I want to turn it into a movie. I actually believed Abby more when she came into my office and told me she was now pro-life than I believed Chuck and Gary when they called and said, we're making a movie about Abby Johnson and we need to portray you and your wife. And I'm like, who is this? The email just said, we read your book. We'd like to turn it into a film. Uh, we'd love to talk with you. And it was signed Chuck Conselman. And I didn't know who that was. After she told me her story and we talked about the lawsuit and what had happened and her history, I was just blown away. And I said, you know, this is this is probably going to be a book one day. I said, they may even make a movie out of this. Abby's story is the most powerful story that the pro-life world has experienced up until this point. Sometimes the bravest thing you can possibly do is change your mind, and that's what Abby did. Seeing both sides and still having that characteristic of passion in helping women is something that people are really going to resonate with. We all have a story, and I, I think the impact that a true story can have, you just can't deny. Everything we've done in this movie is absolutely true. We haven't added or detracted from, from anything. We just tell the story straight as it is. You would think it's a film about life ending, but in many ways, it's a film about life beginning again. You actually get to encounter what women go through. You actually get to see what the reality is. I think that's gonna be huge for people. and be mind-changing. What this film does is allow us to look behind the curtain, look behind all the social media, see what's really happening in the clinic from an insider's perspective. There's never been a movie like this, and it's going to get labeled so many things. It'll be the anti-Planned Parenthood movie, the anti-abortion movie, the anti-woman movie, the anti-fill-in-the-blank, right? But the reality and the problem for the abortion industry is that it's true. I think once they see what's going on and watch the movie, I would I would say that there are going to be a lot of people going, wow, I can't believe this was even happening in our country. We moved forward in faith all throughout prep without knowing that we had the money to make the film until we got really close to shooting. And I had employees that were on for 10 weeks that didn't know if they'd had a job the next week. You know, I would tell them, okay, we can go another week and you're employed and hope to show up on Monday because uh, we're not sure we have enough to pay for the following week. So um, there's a commitment level that begins there when people would say, I'm so committed to this project. I want to be here. I want to be a part of this. I want to see this thing through. That, that kind of buy-in is not the same as I'm just showing up for a paycheck. We slid into the week before we were scheduled to start shooting with our financing incomplete and without a lead female for the role to play uh, Abby Johnson. Which you're not supposed to do. And rather than with doing, a week left. And we were unable to push the beginning of our shooting dates. Now we're Monday morning, we're shooting. We've got a 4,000 square foot set. We have 150, 200 people working. We've got millions of dollars at stake here. And the Thursday night, we still don't have a lead. We gotta do hair, makeup, she change her hair to red. 52 wardrobe looks 52. in the movie, and she hasn't, and no one started lining up her clothing yet. I mean, this is. we didn't know who it was gonna be. So we're going through the list, literally one by one, I'm getting chopped down. The last person on my desk is this person, Ashley Bratcher. When I first auditioned for Unplanned, I didn't really know who Abby was and I was so compelled just from those three pages of sides. I got online immediately. I listened to her testimony. I watched her videos on YouTube. And listening to Abby speak and tell her story, I was floored. I mean, I was just ugly crying. And it really, it really hit home for me um, on a very personal level. And I was just so moved by it that I, I went home and I told my husband, I said, I need to be a part of this film. She then sends us two emails with passion that was so powerful and then speaks to us on the phone and says, all I can say is two years ago, the Lord 
spoke to me and told me he had a mighty work for me to do, but I was not ready. But when I was, he would tell me what it was and would bring it forward. And she says, I know this. This is my story to tell. Her story and I was, well. she was so passionate. I was warned by multiple people, even people who knew that I had auditioned and just read the script said, you'll never work again. I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Don't do it. And I said, there's no way I can't not do it. She is Abby Johnson. Is Even Abby Johnson, when she was on the set, said, that's me. And I can't believe it. Our actress that plays Abby, Ashley Bratcher, plays her beautifully. She has filled that role so well. Well, who am I supposed to talk to about this? I don't know. All right, I don't know. All I know is that here we are eight years later, and you're still thinking that you can change them. And the only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Abby is really feisty. <laughs> and she says, she says it how it is, which is one thing I really love about her. And I may have been told that I'm kind of like that <laughs> a couple of times. What I'm saying is that I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. I think that Abby fell in love with Mark because he was charismatic. He's a great looking guy who told her everything she wanted to hear. And when she found herself pregnant for the first time with Mark, she leaned on him to give her the right answer and it wasn't the right answer. Hey, it's all right, it's all right. We'll take you to a clinic and take care of it. So I had already come to Oklahoma and I had been working for a couple of days and my mom called me. I don't have a wonderful relationship with my parents. It's been, I had kind of a rocky childhood. My mom had always been very open with me when I was younger that she had had an abortion before me. Um, and she had always said things like, I was gonna abort you, but I chose not to. Like I could never do that. But I did know that when I got ready to tell my mom that I was doing this movie and start explaining who Abby is and what the film's about, that she might have an emotional reaction. And she did, but more than I anticipated. Um, I could just feel her weeping through the phone and I said, Mom, <laughs> as a... I said, Mom, what's wrong? <laughs> and she said, you don't know this, <laughs> but I was there in the clinic. They had called my name, and I was in the room to abort you, and I got up and walked out. Uh, and I had no idea. <laughs> And so you were literally 10 seconds away from an abortion. Now, 30 years later, she's going to become the face of the pro-life world. Can God cook or what? It's a very different concept to hear someone say, you know, abortion was an option, but I chose not to do that. As opposed to hearing you're seconds away, just minutes, seconds away from never having existed. But it's really evidence that God has just planned my steps long before I ever set foot on earth to be here doing this today. She was created before time by God for this moment, for a time such as this. So I guess technically I'm an abortion survivor and I never knew it. <laughs> this is truly a before I, I formed you in the womb, I knew your moment. She was created to play this role. Amazing. people to think that this is just some movie about abortion because there's a really beautiful love story I think between Doug and Abby. He is just so incredibly supportive and he he just loves her unconditionally. You're not supposed to look happier than I do. There's a really beautiful scene in the movie where Abby comes home and has had just a very hard day at work. Um, she's standing over Grace's crib, just looking at her little innocent baby there, just sleeping. So he comes up behind her and just basically lets her know that he's got her. Do you have any idea how much I love you? It's nice to know, not alone, 
And you're committed to carrying this pregnancy to term. I am. We are. We only have so much time, so much energy. If you choose to spend it elsewhere, there's less of you for here. Look, I already warned Doug, we are one and done. In our story, Cheryl is the face of Planned Parenthood. This is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl D'Alessandro, clinic director. Welcome, nice to meet you. You too. When Abby begins to realize that her own views are beginning to separate from the official Planned Parenthood line, it's Cheryl then that she'll be having her friction with. We are paying you to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy, and corporate policy is simple. We are an abortion provider. In Unplanned, you see the true agenda being revealed, and that Honestly, Planned Parenthood is a multi-billion dollar business. Congratulations. You've managed to make an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. The statistics for abortion are mind-numbing. Worldwide since 1980, 1 1.5 billion abortions. That's what, a quarter of the planet missing? That's crazy. I think some of the most telling statistics, the most shocking statistics about abortion are just the gross numbers of abortions that take place every year. So we're at about a million abortions a year, about 3,000 a day, and this is just in the United States. And about one in three women in the U.S. have had an abortion or will have an abortion by the time they're 45. There are places in the United States where there are more African-American babies being aborted than born. To know that there is a, a silent genocide that is, is going on and occurring um, predominantly in uh, minority communities is, is a major issue. Rhonda, Rhonda, babe, please don't do this. Please don't do this. Whatever you need, you can come live with us. 79% of abortion facilities are put in minority neighborhoods. That baby you're carrying is going to be just as beautiful as Louie. Rhonda, Rhonda, don't do this. Rhonda! Within our African American community, millions of unborn children have never seen the light of day. How many doctors, how many lawyers, how many pastors never had the opportunity for their gifts and their destinies to come into fruition? There is no justice for the unborn because we don't see them die. Because it's done in secret, people don't really understand what's taking place inside the womb. Part of the rationale in our culture for abortion being uh, as available as it is, is that the fetus is nothing more than a clump of cells. At this stage, between six and eight weeks, it's just fetal matter. A lump of tissue, not much more than a polyp or a blood clot. That's been the party line for a very long time. And if that's all it was, if it was no more than getting a tooth removed, let's say, well, you shouldn't worry about it too much. So he's not a baby yet? No, not at all. And you can't feel any pain? None whatsoever. But most everyone is coming to realize, because of the ultrasounds, that it's not a clump of cells anymore. It is actually a baby. When Abby was a clinic director, 70% of her clients would self-describe as Christian. In the Christian church at large, in the Catholic church, it's no longer spoken of from the pulpit because it's such a divisive issue Priests and pastors are afraid to speak of this issue, and that needs to change. You can throw your hands up in the air, you can get mad, you can get frustrated, you can blame Washington, D.C., you can blame your uncle who's pro-abortion, you can blame so many people, but you have to respond. And the first response has to be offering this up to God and asking for his help. So in 1998, Planned Parenthood announced plans that they would build the first ever abortion facility in College Station, Texas, a, a city with about 60,000 college students. And they bought the land under a different name. 
Then they announced that it would be an abortion facility. And people at that moment in that community started going out and praying when it was just a pile of dirt. And they were praying from that moment on till the day that Abby legitimately left. 40 Days for Life came about out of frustration. We saw our local abortion numbers going up at that Planned Parenthood. So we did 40 days of prayer and fasting and 40 days of a non-stop peaceful vigil outside of Abby's Planned Parenthood abortion facility. And that building now is a crisis pregnancy counseling clinic, very pro-life, and also the national headquarters for 40 Days for Life. I dare say those prayers had some effect. Unbelievable. If abortion can end in one community, then it can end anywhere. Right from the outset when we started planning this film, we knew we were going to need a prayer ministry team. We knew we were going to need protection. We knew there was going to be a lot of spiritual warfare going on surrounding the film, filming of this project. I've worked on sets before that have had people come and pray on set, but never ever have I experienced it to the magnitude that I felt it on this film. The prayer ministry team that we put together was Catholics, Evangelicals, all kinds from every denomination. I remember filming the most difficult scene in the movie, the abortion, um, the chemical abortion scene, and not realizing that not only our prayer team, but some of our crew members were standing outside of the wall holding it up with their hands, just praying over the scene. The cast and crew all said that they'd never been on any kind of a set that was anything like this. There was such a, there was such a feeling of peace, there was such a feeling of calm, there was such a feeling of camaraderie over the shooting. And, and for anyone that's not been around a movie set before, that's not the norm. So we knew the power in prayer. It was so powerful, as a matter of fact, that on every movie we do for now, it's a line item in our budget for now on. And so we intend to do it in an even bigger way. We want to recruit, for anyone who's listening, we want a million prayer warriors praying for this movie. So if you wanted to help, for, uh, help us in any way at all, that's the way you could do it. I think Unplanned does a beautiful job of showing the most effective way to reach these people and how to reach these people with the heart of Christ. Why are you telling me this? Because I understand better than anyone that inside that building, they don't offer solutions. They only offer abortions. And if you go through that door, you will not come out the same person because you can't. And everybody wants to pretend like you can, but you can't. Because the truth is you can let them get rid of your baby, but they can't get rid of the memory of your baby. And neither can you, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> you know what to do. What's your name? Hannah. It's going to be okay, I promise. I promise, and I'll be there every step of the way. I'll do anything I can to help you. Media is the most important, most powerful tool for evangelization, for spreading word, an idea, a theory. I mean, there's nothing that is as powerful as the media. Uh, we've always said that if John or Paul or Peter or any of the apostles were here today, they wouldn't go door to door knocking and saying, let me tell you about Jesus. What they would, what they would do is they go and make a movie. No movie has spoken to post-abortive women like Unplanned will speak to them. This is the first thing that's come along powerfully from the other direction, saying, saying, oh, by the way, there's another side to this argument. No one will be able to walk away from this movie and say, I didn't know. And, and to me, that is the most powerful piece of this film. My dad is 84 years old, God, God bless his soul. Jewish man, very pro-choice, he's an atheist, he's everything in that way, okay? And he called me up and he said, baby, baby, uh, wh wh what are you doing? Well, he hadn't noticed that I was making a movie, okay? So I said, Dad, I'm making a movie. He says, okay, okay, yeah, send me something, send me something. Okay, so I sent them the barrel scene. In this barrel scene, they are wheeling out the refuse in two bleak, big blue containers. What people don't realize is, in the containers are babies. Is that what I think it is? Great, so? 
and they bring it to a sanitation truck, a, a waste truck, which carts it off and then gets rid of it. So my father starts to watch it. Do you mind if we pray over it? I don't know about that, man. Please. Ten seconds in, he stops and I hear him choking up. And he can't speak and he says, oh, I, I, I can't talk about this anymore. I, I, I'll call you tomorrow. Bang. Next day comes, he gives me a call and he says, we have to stop this abortion thing. We need to make laws to stop this. He said, you've shown us what we didn't want to see. And just see, bam, what, 10 seconds of film, going back to what we said, why it's so powerful, 10 seconds of film changed the position that he had his whole life. Now we have a face, we have a voice from the inside that is showing us what we've never seen before. I hope Unplanned the story of Unplanned, this true story, is transformative for people. We've got all this love actually working all through the film, and you see the power of what love can do. These women need hope, and they need the mercy of God. And everything else the world tells you it's just gonna go away, or it's not a big deal, that is a complete lie. And this movie will really speak to that reality. I think what uh, this movie Unplanned is gonna be able to do is really be able to help people see um, what's going on behind closed doors. Abortion's in our history, let's keep it there. Let's leave it there. And let's see a country, a culture, where we love children and moms, where we don't pit them against each other, but we can love them both. I believe that it's time for us to really listen to what God is trying to say on this issue. And that's why this is such an important message for this hour. That's what I think of this movie is going to really help people that don't don't realize what, what they're doing, what's been going on for 50 years. They're going to, this is going to be an awakening. My heart, my prayer is, is just to go out and expose what's taking place inside of these abortion facilities and to let people know that there is hope and there is healing and there is forgiveness. And there's no condemnation because of what we've done in the past. And, you know, I hope that Unplanned will, will give people that hope. In our career, we've made many movies. We've been in the business for over 30 years. Nothing we've done in our lives is as important as this movie. There's never been, this is more than a movie. This has to become a movement. This is about simply saving babies' lives. We're really excited about getting this movie out because we think it's going to have a real impact on culture. And there are many ways you can help us. The first being prayer. The second is spreading the word on social media or talking to your friends, word of mouth. The third way is you can donate. And every dollar that comes in, we will spend that on the marketing of the movie and to bring people to theater. Creating awareness for the film. And lastly, theater buyouts. What you do is you go to unplanned.com and there you can rent the theater and bring all your friends and relatives or if you're an organization or a corporation. Doing a red carpet screening in your very own town. We're pleased and proud to be bringing you this film in the spring of 2019. And we look forward to seeing you at the movies. Just happen by chance As long as my God holds the world in his hands I know that there's no such thing as a man
All right, so I don't know if my mic is working. Can you hear? Okay. Um, I'm happy to tell a story right away. I'm happy to answer questions and start that process. Uh, I noticed one of the areas of this film that had the most reaction was when Carrie Solomon used the expression, can God cook or what? Uh, that's what I meant when I said all these miracles going on. This film was produced uh, largely to be able to accompany all the hundreds of buses that come from all of the United States for the March for Life. It was finished just a few days before that pilgrimage occurred. And so I'm pleased to be able to say that um, our son and our daughter were on buses from Notre Dame St. Mary's, and I believe this was the largest turnout they've ever had. Uh, I'm not sure how many, but it, it, at least a dozen buses. And so uh, the Notre Dame and St. Mary's students saw it. They're very creative people. When they got back to campus, they had an event coming up at the end of the week, and they were promoting the event, and at the end they said, can God cook or what? <laughs> so um, this is a movie that is very real. Um, one of the miracles is that I'm somehow involved with this. And would you like to hear that story? OK. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. My sister-in-law, Susan, is here. My sister, Sue, and my brother-in-law, Bob, so they know it's very difficult for me to keep things brief. But uh, the brief version is that um, in November of 2015, um, I received a call because uh, really since the age six, I've had this sense I'm supposed to be involved in film somehow. That's a different story I can tell you if someone wishes outside. Uh, but it's been very clear in my mind. Um, in any event, I'm a very conservative person, and this didn't make sense to kind of go in that direction. So um, about 12 years ago, my wife Mary Claire said, you know, you need to pay attention to this sort of vocational calling. So I read everything I could on the film industry and started attending a, a retreat in Hollywood with a handful of Catholics every November. And I'm sure everybody wondered, who is this person from Livonia, Michigan at this retreat? <laughs> there are stories I could tell you about that. Because of that interaction over the last 12 years or so, when the script for Unplanned surfaced, it's very difficult to make an independent film. All kinds of obstacles, and that can be part of our discussion. Uh, the first obstacle is raising substantial amount of money to be able to do two budgets. One is a production budget, and the second is called a P&A, Prints and Advertising or Marketing Budget. So I received a call in November 2017 from a friend of mine from that circle, knowing that I'm trying to do what I can in the world of pro-life, uh, knowing that I know something about the film industry, and knowing that I might know generous people who would be willing really to invest mostly for the cause as opposed to an investment. So I said, well, sure, but I said, I've read enough to know about the film industry that I cannot approach good people knowing that this is the worst investment you can make unless I understand whether we have a chance. And so um, you have a chance if you have a true story, if it's based on a national bestseller, and if the production values, if there's sufficient funding to ensure that the production values are at the top shelf level. So I said I need to interview this Carrie Solomon and Chuck Councilman, and we had them on a speakerphone, and I had a few investors at the conference room table, and I started putting them through the paces on what I had learned through reading about filmmaking. They were very patient. Um, but they had to wonder, who is this person? <laughs> and finally, at the end, I said, you know, I need to read the script. And um, I, I wanted to read the script because I wanted to be in, uh, confident that it matched the book because we can fully expect Planned Parenthood to say, well, that's an exaggeration. That's somehow a fabrication. The script was beautiful. It matched the book exactly. So the final question I asked was, are you familiar with the passion and the making of the passion? In these retreat experiences, I had the privilege of meeting Jim Caviezel, 
who played the role of Jesus in the Passion. And if those of you who know much about the making of the Passion, all kinds of spiritual warfare, including Jim Caviezel being struck by lightning on the cross during the filming, uh, they took a number of precautions that way. So I said to these people on the phone, I said, are you prepared for that? And what are your preparations? They said, we will have a Catholic priest on set every day that we're filming. We will also have a pastor there. And as you see from this, uh, they were quite serious about that. So that's when I knew this could work. <laughs> and uh, the phone uh, conference concludes. Um, fortunately, the people in the room took my word for it with regard to the script. And um, we were able to supply the foundational funding that enabled the project to get off the ground. And so Carrie Solomon refers to me as the person who launched Unplanned. So if there are any plan <laughs> uh, so, so again, that's another miracle, I would say, uh, because you know, it's an interesting way in which it came about. Um, are there questions that you have? Yes. Okay. We're just going to get a microphone to you to help you. So uh, first, by way of background, um, you may have seen the film or heard of the film Gosnell, which is, um, which is also a very fine film and really a breakthrough in the film business. Uh, Gosnell is essentially a crime story, and, um, and, and, and the, those who were disappointed from the pro-life world were disappointed only in the sense that it didn't quite show what the reality of abortion. But nonetheless, um, Gosnell was available years ago, but the industry blocked it and they couldn't get distribution. That's a really key step. So uh, we did um, everything with great precaution. We had a person from the Gosnell team on our team to learn what they experienced. And I can tell you about some of the precautions that we're taking, which are quite astonishing. Um, so we had arranged, negotiated with Pure Flix in advance of announcing the film. And uh, we opened in about 1,200 theaters because once we had a distributor, we were in business. They are connected to the chains, and the chains all work with the distributor. And after the first weekend, it did so well, uh, it doubled what the industry expected that we expanded by about another 700 theaters. Um, and as I think I mentioned, we have gotten requests from all over the world for this film. So we also open in Spanish as well as English the same on March 29th. Uh, so, other questions? So, you know, you can only anticipate a certain number of things, but we knew distribution was key. You know, uh, if the industry can lock that down, you can be a Gosnell for three years, have everything done, and can't get going. Here are some things that occurred. Uh, we had seven pieces of music that all of the artists who created the music were enthusiastic about having it support this film. However, artists are generally represented by a distribution company licensed through Warner Brothers or Disney or, and all of those entities, including the two I just mentioned, blocked use of that music. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I think we have a beautiful score and the original music that you hear at the end uh, is quite inspiring. But, so that was an obstacle that, you know, and, and the thing is it hits you at a time where everything has to be, um, you can't be interrupted because if you are, the schedule that you're on is, is thrown off. Another obstacle was uh, you can't really start raising funds for the marketing of the film until you have finished the film because you have to be able to show potential investors the quality of the product that you're asking them to promote. So you only, in our case, had you know, three or four months to raise $7 million for the marketing. We did that, had that completed about a month and a half, 45 days before the opening weekend. So now, good timing, you know? But every cable uh, network, with the exception of Fox, refused to accept our money to play our trailer proposed the promotion of this film, including, I'm very sad to say, the home TV network, uh, Hallmark. <laughs> uh, so, so those are some obstacles. Um, maybe the one that you've heard of in the news, 
which the Senate has now held a hearing, thanks to Senator Ted Cruz, is that we have a Twitter account that was up and running for a year and had thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. In the film business, the opening weekend is like election night. You have all this momentum to opening weekend, and, and you have to succeed opening weekend, or the, those showing the film week by week decide whether to continue showing it. And so, remember, we don't have any conventional advertising going on, so we're doing what we can with social media and other things. Unfortunately, we live in a day and age with a lot of other ways to communicate. So um, Twitter is very important because that's when people are coming out of the theaters and they're issuing a message about what they just saw. And um, Twitter shut down our Twitter account. And, um, and, and so uh, they, they suggested that there was, it was initially a mistake and then it was shut down again. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, 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 <laughs> uh, the first talk that I gave this week was at a, a beautiful parish called St. Odillo's. Um, you know and, uh, the day after Easter, and I would say a few hundred people came out. And uh, I saw a man wearing a Davidson shirt. And I went up to him before we started, and I said, gee, uh, do you have someone attending Davidson? Uh, are you from North Carolina? He said, I'm a lifelong Chicagoan. I've just retired. I have um, a business that includes uh, a major social networking communication system. And I posted an announcement regarding your talk at our parish tonight. And Facebook shut me down. Th this is a significant reality <laughs> that we have to be aware of. Yes? We should all be outraged by what you just said about Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. Well, so th we live in such a fast-paced world that it, it's going to take some time. But I, I did, I did uh, Catherine introduced me to um, some very accomplished attorneys <laughs> this week who asked the same question. <laughs> and um, various theories were kicked around that seemed pretty tangible. <laughs> So I don't know. We'll see. But you can imagine the business interruption claim that could be had, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions potentially. Um, so did that answer the question that you had with enough detail? <laughs> There's more I could give, but that gives you a sense. You, uh, you mentioned precautions earlier, and then mm -hmm. you go into that. What kind of precautions? OK. Uh, so. This, this, is, um, this is a scary situation uh, because uh, there's a lot of evil surrounding abortion. Uh, and a lot of people have been touched by abortion. And so most of what we all want to do, and I hope everyone wants to be presenting hope and love and redemption and encouragement. Um, but there is a reality of evil. So I, I, I was part of the founding of a group called Lawyers for Life in Cincinnati about 25 years ago. And we had a speaker who came, was a young um, pro-life activist, who uh, told us that um, she was working on a, a legislation in Ohio. I'm just giving you this by way of precursor, and then I'll tell you about the film. Uh, we, we were one of the first people in the nation, probably, to hear of this um, situation. Uh, she first told us about partial birth abortion. There were two people in the country doing it. One was in Dayton, and the other is portrayed in the film uh, in Wichita, Kansas. And um, uh, so uh, she also said that she went out to her car in Akron, Ohio um, it, that one morning, and it just didn't sound right as she was starting the car. It just wasn't. So she got out of the car, and the car explodes. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, She's still an effective pro-life advocate. I think she's in Florida now. But um, uh, so, so there, there are these things that happen that we don't know, we don't hear about. Um, so uh, there was an investor who um, was very gracious and uh, wanted Mary Claire and I to go to the set and uh, had the ability to take us on his own plane with his wife, and so that we could go down and back because. Um, in our case, we have seven children with high school schedules and so forth. We, we can't be away too long. So, so we went down. And I like to meet people. And uh, as we're arriving at the set, 
uh, I see Carrie and I introduce myself and Chuck and um, that was the first time I met them in person and then as I'm getting ready to go into the studio that they had created there was a very intimidating person with a beard that uh, was a, below his chin, <laughs> below his own neckline and uh, if you can think of the stereotypical Harley Davidson figure then if you can magnify that ten times that was this person <laughs> and Carrie could tell I was frightened <laughs> and uh, he said oh don't worry about him he's a Navy SEAL we have three of them on set um, we filmed 75 miles of film three different sets they were sent to three different cities we filmed under a different name you might have saw a little detail in the clipboard it didn't say on plan it said redeem um, those are some precautions and then of course all the important spiritual precautions uh, uh, yeah so so there were, there were three different actresses who had been cast uh, for the lead role all accepted and all within 24 hours were talked out of proceeding by their families and their agents and Ashley Bratcher is speaking in the Chicago area sometime next week and please go see her she is a really talented in a fair world those of you who have seen it in a fair world she would win best actress hands down mm -hmm. it's that good for those of you who haven't seen it in a fair world the person who plays the Planned Parenthood representative Robia Scott would win best supporting actress she's very good <laughs> There was a person who told a friend of mine that there were only two films that he's prayed throughout the whole film. Uh, one of them was The Exorcist, the other one was Unplanned. <laughs> Robia Scott is a very effective pro-life speaker. She had been an actress about 15 years ago and is in ministry in the last 15 years and um, she came out to play that role and very convincing. <laughs> so, yes. I was I was wondering if since the film has been showing you've had different religious leaders like from different denominations around the country contact you to have that discussion about talking about abortion from the pulpit and with their congregations again since they don't anymore because it is such a controversial issue I I would hope that you would start to see that happen more Yes, so I'm Catholic, and in the Catholic world, the Pro-Life Secretariat Committee is, um, is led by Archbishop Nauman of Kansas City, and uh, he's been fantastic. Um, he, um, we screened it for him and others, uh, and at the March for Life at the Basilica, he gave the homily, and in the homily he said, if you only see one film in 2019, see Unplanned. Uh, so there, there, there is, uh, I don't know exactly to what level, uh, before the, um, the film came out, another obstacle we faced was that the motion picture industry, we had expected PG, maybe PG-13, uh, there's nothing in the film that would uh, qualify as R in the sense that there's no immodesty, there's no profanity, there's no excessive violence, there's no um, exploited violence. So on the one hand, we were sort of happy that it's an R-rated in the sense that it, it made us, enable us to say, well, even the motion picture industry understands this is a very serious business. But from a strategic standpoint, uh, the experts on the team said that, no, no, that this is a roadblock. What, they, what this means is we cannot show our trailer before any film other than the R-rated film. So that narrows the audience that could even know about it if they're in the film. And uh, we have in this country the ability for a person to, without their parental consent, receive an abortion but not see unplanned. Uh, and it is a very important film for, uh, I, I have spoken to an eighth grade class and shown this to them at the request of their pastor. Um, and uh, they were terrific watching this and the young men kind of put their shoulders back and they want to protect it. Certainly every high school person needs to see this. So uh, I think. Um, okay, so I, I, I know that in addition, uh, uh, I'm, I'm told that the Mormon community uh, have sort of rules and, and some um, evangelical uh, Christian communities have rules against seeing R-rated films. So there was discussion with those leaders before it came out, once we got the R rating. And uh, Franklin Graham was terrific, Billy Graham's son promoting it. Um, there was one person who said, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell people R for recommended. <laughs> you know, so, uh, 
but it, it was a huge obstacle, you know. Uh, yes, ma'am. Unfortunately, uh, no, he, he had nothing to do. George Soros is a brilliant person, um, but uh, he had nothing to do with supporting this. At, and, and I'm very sad to say that his foundation, you know, he's preparing where his resources go, has dedicated enough funding, I was just told this because I'm visiting Chicago, to abort the population of Chicago. Uh, how a person so sophisticated would want to direct money on that scale that way, I don't know. But we did have potential investors who said, I, I want you to take that scene out where you're naming certain people that support Planned Parenthood. And the filmmakers said, you know, we can't do that. Uh, this is part of the story. And hopefully, hopefully George Soros will change his mind. Or, so, yeah, uh, or, or who knows? I mean, but no, unfortunately, I think Robia Scott character is an illustration of the hardened heart, which uh, you know happens. And, uh, uh, yes. Michael, can you talk about maybe the impact uh, this had on the careers of the people, of the actors and the techs and the directors? Sure. Are they ever going to work again, or is that? Yeah. So all all of them understood they were taking a, a significant risk by doing this. Um, and um, uh, that, but as you saw, Ashley Bratcher in particular said that she, I cannot do this, you know, cannot not do this. Uh, uh, everyone who was um, part of the crew and the uh, sort of technical team, you know, were screened to ensure that uh, they were at least open to the pro-life uh, argument. Uh, the production of Carrie and Chuck were very open about that. There's another film that's trying to get started called Roe vs. Wade. And you may have read the news in June, they were ready to start filming, but they hadn't told the people what it really was about, and their whole crew left, you know? So we took a different approach. You know, we, um, we, we screened for that. And uh, by and large, uh, as far as we know, most of the people were at least open to the pro-life position. Uh, I did hear that there were a few who, who really kind of slipped in there. <laughs> but then became pro-life through this process. Um, you've uh, reminded me of an interesting story, which is that um, there's a, a married couple on the, as part of the team um, who were expecting a child, and they uh, donated their 13-week ultrasound for the ultrasound image. And now there's a directory of all those who fe are featured in the film, and this is the youngest person ever <laughs> listed in the directory. <laughs> that child is now about four months old. Uh, so lots of ways to communicate pro-life. Uh, yes, sir. We, we were, we were had the, the lead team was, I think, pretty strategic about rolling this out. and so. I don't think Planned Parenthood really became aware of it until a couple of weeks before. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I was, I was interested in tracking what happens during that time period, and it was silent, you know? And so others, we were all kind of concluding, well, they're probably taking the approach that, let's just see if this blows over, you know, it might just flop, and uh, why even say anything? So when it did so well opening weekend, then the first press release comes out. And it says what you would expect. Well, this is an exaggeration. We're actually a healthcare provider, and this is not true. And um, but that's why it was so was so important to me to be able to say this has got to be exactly like the book, because that's an impossible position to take. Abby Johnson was the youngest clinic director in the history of Planned Parenthood, and a few weeks before this episode occurred. She was literally at their annual fundraiser, literally sitting next to Hillary Clinton, the honored guest, given the award for the person of the year, the person that did everything by the book so well that she's named as the top employee of the year. So it's impossible to say <laughs> that this is. A, so the next thing that came um, a couple days later was the first New York Times piece. And uh, we were expecting this. Uh, they had an abortionist take the position um, that, well, a 13-week-old would, would, would not be aware and would not, would not be kind of moving away from the catheter, and that's, that's a misrepresentation. Um, so I'm reading this, and I, I researched who this person is. I have a little office space in the basement of Domino's Farms, and it turns out this is a young abortionist who does ultrasound-guided 
uh, abortions, and she's only a few years out of medical school, located about a mile from where I'm sitting. <laughs> and uh, so we um, made some calls, and there are doctors all over the world that were prepared to respond, and we put together uh, an editorial in response. And so those have been the kind of the two primary Planned Parenthood things, but do you think it might be possible that Planned Parenthood would know somebody at Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> or most recently, if you look up Unplanned, do a Google search, you'll find drama slash propaganda. Now, I have never seen a film labeled propaganda. <laughs> and you can imagine anybody who's like on the fence about whether to see this, is this a real movie or is this somebody trying to just persuade me to be pro-life? And they go look, look it up, and they see propaganda. Well, I'm not going to go. So, so perhaps Planned Parenthood influenced that. I, I'm just suggesting that they may know people. I don't know. Uh, I do know that on Tuesday night, when I was at a presentation, I mentioned the story about how the night before my little talk was shut down, uh, a person in the audience said, I have a very good friend who works at Google who just left. and." Um, the culture there is, and he still is of this mindset, that we have the right, authority, ability to censor who we want to. And uh, it's a dangerous mindset. Yeah. So I'm giving longer answers. I hope that I wanted to make sure I answered that one, though. OK. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, that's a great question. So we had uh, some strategies before we opened where um, there were uh, tickets being delivered or, or vouchers into Planned Parenthood facilities. Uh, we had a different, so 40, this film is ultimately about 40 Days for Life also. Remember, they begin at the same time that Abby Johnson is beginning. It's a beautiful miracle, really. So we had over 440 Days for Life volunteers at theaters that were uh, bringing people they knew were not pro-life, giving them a free ticket and say, just come accompany me to see this. And we've gotten all kinds of reports of people changing their minds. If you want, I have uh, I have a little testimony on my phone I could read to you. It's pretty powerful um, that there was a, a wonderful uh, lady in Ann Arbor who wanted to inspire University of Michigan students. And for those of you who don't know University of Michigan very well, um, it, it is, um, well, I mean, the abortionist who was quoted in the New York Times is sort of the epicenter for a, a lot of um, Planned Parenthood activity. They, they've had various things. So in any event, uh, the, uh, so, so she wanted to sponsor the U of M Students for Life, and hopefully they would bring students as well. And she did, and the students sent uh, back the response, and it, amazing. I mean, these students uh, were saying, I'm, I, would you like me to read a portion of her statement? Yeah? OK. okay. This, the movie was incredibly impactful. I saw many students crying during and after the movie. Our group decided to be more committed to praying in front of abortion clinics. So we appointed a committee chairman to our new prayer committee who will be in charge of organizing this initiative for next year. Uh-oh. Oh, there we are. Uh, so, we'll be doing sidewalk counseling and praying next year consistently. I know the students in my group were more committed to the cause, as you're saying, um, after seeing this film and seeing a depiction of abortion. Many were moved by the main actress's acting, and I had many students from Young Americans for Freedom reach out to me and ask to join Students for Life after watching Unplanned. We brought some students from other student organizations, and as a result of this movie, they want to be more involved with ours. We are able to see the reality of Planned Parenthood and abortion and become more convicted to share this message. Um, one of our students wrote, it helped me see into the abortion industry in a way I hadn't been able to before. Not only did it show the heartbreaking realities of an abortion procedure, its effect on the mother, child, and family, but the ways that their business model is far from the compassionate nonprofit that they show to the world. So, really powerful. Um, yes, uh, now you, you had a question earlier. I want to make sure I didn't forget you. So, I'll give you two examples. And what was the question? 
Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, uh, could you comment further about spiritual warfare? What does that mean? And how, how, how might that be manifested in the context of the making of this film? OK, so Father Mark has offered to be um, back me up with the expertise. I'll, I, I will tell you two things that were reported to me, and there were many others. But in every meeting, we started with a prayer. We did everything we could. But um, we had a team of uh, people in uh, Nashville Tennessee that were in charge of um, managing the advance sales. So we had hundreds of theaters that were booked in advance. She started with four people, expanded to six, and then eight, then 12. And uh, they were running uh, at least six days a week because I was getting an email 11 o'clock at night on Saturday night. And I was speaking to her because I was trying to take care of um, a certain group of benefactors. Uh, and so I, I had the um, ability to call her directly and help us make sure we got those set. And um, I was speaking to her on the phone. And I said, um, you know, how's everything going? I said, I'm getting these messages really late. You're, gosh, you're really working hard. Is everything OK? And, uh, and she just sort of laughed with a kind of a, sigh, a sense of um, she'd been down this road before. And she said, well, it's a little bit more difficult now because uh, I've got a broken arm. and I'm." And it, I said, how'd that happen? And, uh, and she said, well, the enemy. You know, I don't know exactly what she means, but uh, we had one uh, team member in Boston uh, who's a, a biker, and she's um, biking down the street. And uh, she, of course, she had a helmet on, but uh, hit by a car, flips over the car, lands on her head, and, uh, and walks away. Uh, uh, so Father Mark will have to kind of explain more of these things. But they're, they're, I've just heard other people talking about um, you know, things that, you'll, you'll do that in your closing prayers? Okay, okay. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, that's why prayer is so important. And remember, three out of four people don't ultimately go through when there are people out there praying, you know? So the devil's not happy with that. Uh, right, yes. Right, yeah, so the... Three years they shut down. So, the, so you might wonder, well, how is it that Abby Johnson could be working there, uh, you know, making sure that they kept open even in the, one of the worst hurricanes, you know, uh, and why, why seven, eight years? Don't you know what's going on in there? They're very, very effective at screening even the workers from knowing what's going on. Uh, the, uh, so I, I don't really want to go into the details of that. But so that's why. And when she saw that image and saw that's the power of that. One yeah. Problem that are there any organizations that will help people like four days for life, or people who want to go in front and pray in front of? Provide yeah, so that's been a big mission of the Knights of Columbus. Uh, the Knights have um, supplied a lot. Uh, are you a fellow knight? Okay, great. Well, it's a great question, and I only know part of it, but I, I would say that uh, uh, could, could I comment on the film industry's response? Um, uh, so, uh, by and large, uh, Hollywood unfortunately is not pro life. Um, and so, uh, I've mentioned a few of the obstacles thrown our way, not allowing us to use music, uh, blocking, um, uh, creating the R rating. Uh, but I think there is a certain amount of astonishment. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there are those who would say, um, well done, you know, from a sort of professional standpoint. Uh, and, um, uh, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, you just hope that uh, over time, and there are, there are pockets of filmmakers, there are lots of people who would like to make great inspiring films. Um, i trying to think, is there more, Scott, that you're asking me to respond to? Oh, 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 yeah. So, so one of the reasons why it was so, thank you, it's so important to get Unplanned out this year is uh, when the script came to me in 2017, I was told that the industry intends to release four pro-abortion films in 2019, 2020. And um, of course, the industry didn't know about Unplanned, but one of them, unfortunately, is the lead actress is Sandra Bullock, who's a, a very talented actress. Um, but she's playing the role of the Texas filibuster who uh, filibustered against a pro-life bill in Texas. So you can see that their industry take is uh, who the hero is, you know? Um, I don't know, maybe this will disrupt that a little bit. 
So, uh, yes, we have. Well, so thank yeah. you for the beautiful yeah. presentation. Colleen, are you recording this? Yeah. <laughs> this will help me at Thanksgiving. Yeah. No, and as I said, I really think all of us will just to run out and do something and spread the word. And as a coincidence or maybe something that was meant to be, I received today from Colombia from my friends that I have a group chat with from school, a change.org uh, sign up petition about the movie in Colombia. So they want the movie to be shown and it seems that they have been having difficulties. Yeah. So I wanted to ask how can we, being from other countries but living here and have connections, yes. and right now I have visiting from Colombia the headmistress and the academic director of a Catholic school in Colombia. How can we do to have the film or to have like copies of the film mm -hmm. to be able to show it there and make good connections with them? Uh, would you mind giving some contact information perhaps to Catherine if Catherine is willing to take that because mm -hmm. uh, so there's some very uh, specific things that we could do. We're doing something that's as far as we know never been done before as it relates mm -hmm. to the international release and so mm -hmm. um, your contact information would help us in Colombia. Thank you. And Thank you. just a, a little second question. Yes, please. Um, once we went to to watch a movie, I don't remember if it was a pro-life movie or a Christian movie or something, and I was surprised that at the theater they didn't have the poster set up like next to the other movies, and I went to ask, and I said, why are you not promoting? And they said, oh, they just sent a poster, and they it got ripped or whatever, that's why we didn't put it up. Um, are you like able to set up the posters to advertise the movie or what can we do about that? Yeah, we had talked about that before we released because we knew that that had to happen with some films. And so um, because PureFlix is a pretty powerful distributor and have a strong relationship with the theater holders, uh, we knew there could be individual theaters that wouldn't. Um, but I haven't heard of a lot of reports um, that way. We've heard a little reports, but because yeah, sort of uh, each theater house, there could be shenanigans, but nothing on a mass scale. Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Thank you, yeah, yeah. So let's see, this gentleman back here had his question, then we'll come back here, yeah. Uh, the, uh, you know, with social media, the beauty of that is, um, you, you know, you can get a word out to lots of people quickly. We had, when we released the trailer, there was some sort of disruption associated with that, and people reacted. We had over three million hits on our trailer that day, which is astonishing. Um, when Ashley Bratcher, I would encourage you to look up, the first interview we did was a few weeks before Christmas, and she was on what I'm told is the number one rated morning television program, which is Fox and Friends. And she was interviewed about her own personal story, and that was the number one story that day in the entire country in terms of how these things are tracked. So it's just a matter of sort of thinking through, um, I mean, uh, <laughs> The, the, you could attend, you could attend uh, this Ashley Bratcher appearance in support of the event next week and, and talk with people there. And there's really no limit um, to, to what can be done unless you want to give a talk and Facebook hears about it. <laughs> Did that help? I don't, you know. Okay. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh. Hi there. I, I was wondering if you could speak to the driving forces of the hatred toward the pro-life movement. How can we neutralize it or invite people to keep an open mind? Um, and I also dare say that Abby has always been passionate, but I, and I have not seen any movie yet, but her passions were initially disordered, like St. Paul's. Mm -hmm. So also the R rating, on some level, it's truthful yeah. because it's about slaughter. Yeah. And I don't know if you can spin it that way. Well, that's how, yeah, no, we yeah. certainly have sort of used that as a way of uh, a, a kind of agreeing and showing that they agree. It's more the practical implications of that. Um, so uh, with regard to, I, I think um, as Sean Carney, a terrific person who was the founder, uh, one of the founders of 40 Days for Life, he was scheduled to head to Notre Dame's law school that summer and the person who founded uh, 40 Days for Life um, had an assignment in DC so he stayed and met his wife and I don't think he's ever gone to law school at Notre Dame. but. Um, 
I think he's a great example of saying everything begins in prayer. So number one, we can all be praying or making that part of our daily prayer. Uh, and so that we have the virtue that when we're talking with someone of the opposite side, that we have sufficient um, you know, grace to uh, reach them. Uh, uh, I, unfortunately, you know, the, the statistics are such that it's very likely that um, you know, someone knows someone who's impacted. So anybody you're talking to, part of their you know, pushback is uh, related to some suffering that they're going through, right? Um, so uh, beyond that, I think, you know, um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I wish to caution everyone that, um, you know, Roe versus Wade, I have to believe, uh, as I hope I would, be, would have believed in 1850, that the Dred Scott decision would be overturned. I have to believe that Roe versus Wade will be overturned. I think a lot of people realize that it will be overturned, including the abortion industry, and that's why what's happening in New York and Illinois and other places going on. But I want to caution you that the great deception that has been going on for about 10 years is sort of this conventional wisdom that when Roe versus Wade is overturned, this decision will go to all the states, and each state can decide. That is total nonsense from a, a legal standpoint, and very few people are willing to say that. But I want to say that to you, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> and, and there are a few others who would say this. Um, I have listened to the oral argument in Roe versus Wade, and you can now do that. Any library probably has it. And when you listen to that, you realize that the justices, uh, at least some of them, understood that if the 14th Amendment is applied to the unborn child, then there is no case because the 14th Amendment is the amendment that came into existence after the 13th Amendment. I'm just going to be two seconds here. I don't want to bore you, but if you haven't seen the movie Lincoln, uh, please see the movie Lincoln. Um, it tells the story of why President Lincoln had to have the passage of the 13th Amendment within about a 45-day period before the war ended. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery, and he wanted that abolished uh, so that there couldn't be shenanigans afterwards. And, uh, and he wanted that, you know, the, the slavery was uh, an integral part of our economy, and he needed to have an amendment to wipe that out. And uh, the movie does a great job. It's a little complicated, so it's worth seeing a few times. I'm very happy to say that the person that introduced the bill was from Toledo, Ohio. I'm not sure if my family knows that. Um, and uh, in any event, um, about two years later, 150 years ago last year, the 14th Amendment was passed. Why did that have to pass? What, what's, what, so it was passed so that never again would we ever violate the Declaration of Independence. Never again would we say that there are certain people that are not entitled to due process, that there are certain people that are not entitled to equal protection under the law. But we've failed twice since then. There was a decision called Plessy versus Ferguson, which had this nonsense concept that you could have things separate, and that's okay, that would be equal. You know, so we had segregation for 70 years. Total nonsense. Finally, that was thrown out based on natural law principles, uh, that every human being is deserving of the inalienable right you know, to due process, to equal protection. So in the oral argument, when you go to the library and you listen, there is a justice who says, you know, if we apply the 14th Amendment equal protection to the unborn human being, you have no case, Sarah Weddington, the youngest person ever to argue a case before the Supreme Court just a couple years out of law school. And she literally giggles in nervousness and says, uh, yeah, I, I'd have a really difficult case. So that's what these Supreme Court justices need to do, is to have the courage to say, what no one will say in the media, that the 14th Amendment absolutely applies to all human beings. And um, you, will, you will hear noise such as, well, that wasn't part of the intent when they passed 150 years ago, the 14th Amendment. Well, there are all kinds of laws that didn't intend to regulate the internet 100 years ago or to deal with automobiles or planes. This is not, an, this is not what those who are Design, uh, manipulating the Constitution are doing. This is not about that. This is about applying the um, understanding, the uh, basic understanding of the words to a situation that uh, is scientifically, factually provable. Whether we have enough, whether we have five justices that will do that, um, 
or not is a big question. Uh, Okay, so, so please don't be fooled by that, and please try to think about it and try, when you hear that, maybe encourage people, well, no, no, it doesn't go back to the States. So this is, this is like, you know, it's set. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious about um, other means of distribution. Um, so does the movie ever make it to a Netflix or an Amazon, and, and kind of what are the economics of that? Is it the filmmaker's decision? Do you have to be invited onto those platforms and with streaming and everything it, it seems particularly if you're trying to get you know to a crowd beyond the pro-life might be easier for someone to turn it on you know on, on the tv than walk into a movie theater so i have been told that netflix has already made the decision they will not show unplanned um, you know hopefully they'll change their mind hopefully that's wrong uh, but I'm also told that Pure Flix has their own sort of Netflix version. But again, it's a little more limited audience, you know. Um, we did have a beautiful story about two weeks ago where a Catholic nun walked into the Los Angeles office and she uh, has a considerable database of um, email followers and she ordered 7,000 DVDs of Unplanned to be able to send one to each of the people on her email chain with the message, I want you to do the same. <laughs> so there'll be a lot of unconventional um, ways in which this, through prayer and uh, miracles, uh, will get out. Uh, and we do have a good team of people that are trying to do everything you're suggesting, you know, um, and uh, you know, so I have to believe that things are going to work out so somehow. What works in the film industry is that Pure Flix, as the distributor of the film at the theaters, has a certain license and right, exclusive right to show it while it's doing its theatrical run. Uh, and that's why you don't see DVDs right away. Um, and then they'll go through an international uh, run. And so, you know, hopefully it's not available for about two years. <laughs> but I would say, you know, typically within five to seven months, um, the DVD then is available, and so uh, then it will be widely available. Yeah. They, I don't want to create the impression that somehow this is a limited release. This is a huge success. It's uh, you know 17,000 theaters. It's all over the country, and it will go around the world. Generally, the film festival route is when you're trying to get the theater system to accept your film. You want to succeed at a festival. So we're, fortunately, we're beyond that. Um, you know, Netflix is probably going to be a problem for us because of what we understand to be the case. But it is something, we have been getting reports that people are seeing this four, five, six, seven times. And mm -hmm. some of it's because of what this young lady was talking about, where they were bringing their friends after seeing it. Uh, others, it's, it's, it is a, it's more of an experience than just a film. It's something that you can see many times. Don't